Hey, good morning, One Church. Hope you guys are doing well. I just want to make a quick video to let you know where I'm at this morning. I am currently actually teaching at North Street Christian Church in Butler, Pennsylvania. North Street is my home church. It's the church that I grew up at. It's the church I came to Christ at. And a while ago, the lead pastor there, Bob Huber, asked me to come and speak during this Christmas season uh, to teach on the Christmas story of North Street. And it'll give a little update on how we're doing as a church, as one church, because North Street is one of our supporters and prayer partners in us doing this thing uh, called One Church. Uh, to help me out, I asked Bob to come and fill in for me at One Church this morning to teach uh, you guys. And so Bob is here. And so while I'm up at North Street, Bob will be here today uh, speaking uh, with you guys as One Church. And Bob has been the lead pastor at North Street uh, since before I was born. So I spent years uh, listening to him preach and teach. He was hugely influential uh, to me uh, in my walk with Jesus and my journey to come and know and follow Jesus. I came to Christ uh, at North Street and Bob was the one that actually invited me to go to Thailand uh, to be on that mission trip that was the catalyst to send me into ministry. So you can thank Bob for me being a pastor, for one church existing. And uh, if you like me as a pastor, you can thank Bob for that. If you don't like me as a pastor, you can thank Bob for that too. Uh, either way, Bob Huber is a fantastic human being. He's a great man of faith. He's a great preacher. And I'm sure he's going to bless us as one church this morning. And so as we're continuing our series called Advent Conspiracy, as we are exploring and, and, and looking at how we need to change Christmas in ourselves to worship Jesus more, uh, to be uh, more wise with how we live out the Christmas season, Bob is going to come and teach us today uh, what it looks like to follow Jesus in this Christmas season. So we're really thankful for that. So let's give it up for Bob as he comes up. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak, and also for sharing Brandon. Brandon is a special, uh, he's not just a young guy anymore, a special man, and uh, the Lord's used him big time, and uh, I've really seen him as a dedicated servant for a long, long time, and he and Danielle certainly are uh, dedicated servants here, and uh, lately I've been stuck on Psalm 103 that says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And, uh, and when I read that, I think, how could we ever bless the Lord? He blesses us, and we pray, bless us, Lord, bless us, Lord. But the Scripture says, let's bless the Lord. And uh, we bless Him by service and obedience and following His will, but also blessing His servants. And I know Brandon and Danielle certainly are blessings to you. And bless them back in every way. And your team is just great here. Thank you so much. Uh, North Street's uh, Christmas series is called Christmas Through the Eyes of a Few Wise Guys. And I invited four different people to speak uh, at North Street. And Brandon is being our wise guy at North Street today. And he's preaching from Luke chapter 2 about the angels. Well, as I come, I want to share a message called An Inconvenient, Unconventional Christmas. And uh, I would say, who here doesn't have a good Christmas story? I'm sure every one of us has one. You know about the time the tree fell over, or the best laid plans that just didn't work out, or the best meal you ever had at Christmas, or the worst meal you ever had at Christmas, or about travel plans, or the snow, or the greatest gift you ever received, or perhaps the, the worst gift you ever received for Christmas about the time the family had no money and everything was homemade and it was wonderful and about the time the family had lots of money and the gifts were homemade and it wasn't so wonderful. But I imagine everybody here agrees with me that our lives are not like a Hallmark movie or when you think it through, maybe they are a bit more like them. So raise your hand. Who here gets the Hallmark movie channel? Raise your hand. Okay. Who watches all the Hallmark movies? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, and uh, who has a, a secret they don't want to tell that I watch them when nobody's home? I think the guys maybe are more like that. But if you watch the Hallmark movie, they all go on like this. There's a missed flight or an unexpected snowstorm or the car breaks down or someone has amnesia or there's a homecoming. And these provide the storyline. And then the plot is about saving the town or saving the business or the factory, about saving a relationship or saving the celebration or saving the cats and dogs. They're always about something that needs rescued. In the Hallmark movies, the unexpected happens. And Christmas is...
inconvenient and unconventional. But in the end, Christmas is better than ever. And after you watch one of those Hallmark movies, you get sort of addicted. And you go get some more cookies and some hot cocoa, and you watch another one. And I did a little research. There's about 150 different Hallmark movies, 22 new ones this year. And tonight, the premiere is called Welcome to Christmas at 8 o'clock. So I imagine through my influence, some of you are saying, I've never watched one, but I'm going to watch one tonight. But they have titles like this, Christmas Next Door, Catch a Christmas Star, A Boyfriend for Christmas, A Christmas Detour, A Christmas Cutter, A Christmas Cookie Cutter, A Cookie Cutter Christmas, uh, Mingle All the Way, Christmas Getaway, and uh, they're all hokey. And they're really all the same story, just with different characters. But as I say, maybe they're more like life than we would ever imagine. But I would say Christmas in real life really sort of mimics those movies, or the movies sort of mimic life, because Christmas brings a lot of joy, but it also brings a lot of heartache. It delivers, you see, the, the happiness, but sometimes there's some grief there are some great and cherished memories. There's the desire to go back to the older times in our lives when we were kids to say, I remember this one Christmas or for one more holiday with someone who's passed. You know, your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa to say, just one more Christmas would have been great or to recreate the past. And I think lots of times that's what we try to do every year, or to fulfill a dream that never seems to come true. And so I just ask you to think about this. What, what's a normal Christmas? Is there such a thing as a normal Christmas? Anybody ever had a convenient Christmas or a conventional Christmas when everything went just the way you wanted it to go? I think for the most part, and one way or another, all of us have had lots of inconvenient and unconventional Christmases. We have to admit that Christmas comes with expectations and obligations and with expenses. And it always seems to come too suddenly. And for many people, this most wonderful time of the year is characterized more by a frantic drive, by financial debt, by family drama, and by failing desire. And uh, have you ever felt like, I don't want to join in this year. It's just come too quickly. It's just coming on so strong. I almost feel pushed into it. I think I'll just give up. Well, I say, you know, who's not driven? Who's not pushed along by this? Who hasn't had some family trouble? Who doesn't have money concerns? who doesn't feel it's just too soon and too close. I think this time of year I find myself doing something that our worship leader at our church taught us to do at a men's breakfast, and that's to breathe. And I'd like us to practice breathing here for a moment. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to breathe together for a count of six and breathe out for a count of eight. Are you ready? Start breathing in. One, two, three, four five, six, out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's more out than in. That's for a reason. Get it all out. Now do it one more time. Ready? In and out. Now I'm not teaching you yoga. That's something they do. But I just have to tell you, in the middle of a busy day or driving down that highway or when the pressure's coming on so too, too strong, just don't forget to take a breath because I think we're just pushed along so much so. So guess what? Today, I want us to take a spiritual breath. I want us to breathe in and breathe out what God has provided. And I want you to understand that guess what? Even the very first Christmas was inconvenient, and it was unconventional. It was full of the unexpected, and with the best laid plans, they went south. Now think of this. That very first Christmas, there was no tree, there was no turkey, there certainly was no ham, there was no family gathering, 
or even a decent place to stay, and the gifts arrive late by a year or two when you study the passage of the Scripture. Most of the people in Bethlehem were just too busy fulfilling their schedules. They were so preoccupied, they went on like nothing ever happened, and they missed it all. They found no room for Jesus when he was born. So think of it this way. In the midst of the miraculous, life drowned out the good tidings of great joy. And that would have been true on that first Christmas, and that's true today. You see, of all the people in the world, it's people like you who gather on the Lord's Day to remember and to worship who have the best chance of really becoming worshipers at Christmas. So we're about to go to the Scripture, and we're going to look at a passage in the book of Luke in chapter 2. Now listen, it's about two old people. The ladies, at least 84 years old. We're not sure how old the man is, but when I look around... I. My wife and I were 64 and 65, are probably the oldest people here. And I just want you to know the two people you're going to meet in Scripture, their names are Simeon and Anna. We're Bob and Kathy. Uh, sometimes old people have something uh, worth receiving. And in the busyness of the first Christmas, just a few weeks later, we're going to find about Simeon and Anna and what they knew about Jesus. So I want to read from Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21 and through the 38th verse. It says, On the eighth day, that's the eighth day after Jesus was born, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. Yeshua It's the name Joshua, which means he saves. And that name was picked by God. And the name, that was the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. Now when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, so that's 40 days later, he's six weeks old now, Joseph, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem, not in Bethlehem, but to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now because that's what they offered, that would mean they are poor. Because normally you offered a, a lamb and a bird. But if you were poor, you could offer two birds. And they did. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting on the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law had required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, I want to stop here for a moment, and I want you to see this old man. I'm guessing he was in his 80s or 90s. He wanted to die, but he knew he couldn't die until God revealed to him who Jesus was, who the Christ child was. And it says he took Jesus in his arms. Now imagine, this is God in the flesh being held by this old man. And I don't know what you see, but I see him cradling him like this. The last time we met Jesus, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in an a, a, a animal feeder, okay? I don't know if he's still wrapped in the swaddling clothes, but he's six weeks old now, so he's moving around a little. He's a little bit bigger, and he certainly is dressed. But I see Simeon taking him in his arms, and then he says in verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised... You now dismiss your servant in peace. He's meaning, I can die now because your promises have come true. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, for glory to your people Israel. 
and Simeon knew. He knew because he was a student of the Old Testament And he knew because of the revelation of the Holy Spirit that this boy was special. This is God's consolation for Israel. And he knew that the Savior would come first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Verse 33 says, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, And I sort of see Simeon taking that boy from under his arm now and maybe holding him out before the Lord because he came as a sacrifice saying to his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce his own soul too. Now there was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never, hardly ever, we would say, left the temple. She may have lived in the temple courts, but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. Do you know a lady like that? It might be your mom who always stays in the presence of the Lord. She doesn't have to be in church to do it, but she's always thinking about the Lord and the Lord's kingdom and the Lord's way, and she's given it up to God all of the time. This was a holy woman, and coming to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the big word, redemption of Jerusalem. So today... I want to share with you five Christmas exclamations. Most of these are adages of the modern day, at least one of them straight from the Scripture. But I didn't take them from the adages. I took them from the Scripture, and you'll see or hear these this time of year. So concerning the inconvenient, unconventional Christmas, I'm asking that God would work in an inconvenient, unconventional way in your life this year. Because until we bow down, we've missed Christmas. The first exclamation is this. Here's your sign. Now, what's that guy's name on TV that says, here's your sign? Jeff, uh, what is it? No, it's Bill Ingvell. Jeff Foxworthy is the redneck guy. I was just checking to see what rednecks are out there like me. It's Bill Ingvall that says, here's your sign. Like he has this one that says, you know, I pulled alongside the road. I had a flat tire. A guy comes along and says, did your tire go flat? He said, nope. He said, I was driving along. Those other three swelled up on me. I had to stop to let the air out of them. Here's your sign. That's what he says. But many people are waiting on a sign from God say, Lord, show me this, show me that. Do you really love me? Do you want me to come to you? And I don't know about you, but I've never seen my name written in the sky. I've never audibly heard God's voice, but I'll tell you what, I've heard God speak to me in my heart and move me along the way. I grew up as a Roman Catholic altar boy, got mad at God when my mom and dad divorced, quit church, met a pretty girl, I ended up marrying her, and uh, through a football injury, But when I started going to church just to sit with her, so by the way, if you came to church to sit by your girlfriend, God might still get a hold of you. It doesn't really matter. But uh, one night I drove out in the country, and I had this old VW, and I pulled the roof back, and I said, God, if you're there, i got to know, because I had written him out of my script, but he hadn't written me out of his. And I didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything, but there was this awesome presence, this warmth that came over to me that was a confirmation, I'm here. I love you. And that was the beginning of me coming back to him. That was my sign, but guess what? I didn't need a special sign. God had already given the sign of signs when his son was born through a virgin woman who lived that sinless life and died that vicarious death and then died on the cross. That was the sign that all should come. Now in the Christmas story, just before we read, the shepherds were told, here's your sign. They said, you'll go into into Bethlehem and you'll find this baby wrapped in swaddling cloth 
and be laying in an animal feeder. Here's your sign. Now, Simeon, he didn't need a sign. He knew. Because of his knowledge of the Word and the revelation of the Spirit. And Simeon may have been a familiar, or was familiar with the Old Testament. Maybe this verse, Isaiah 25, 9, that says, In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in Him and He saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in Him. Let us rejoice and be glad in His salvation. Simeon knew that day was coming. And so I want you to say, if you're waiting on God to call your name, he had you come here for a reason. He had me say what I just said for a reason. And in the book of 2 Peter, it says, don't forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. It means God doesn't keep track of time. He doesn't need to. He doesn't care if you're 15 55 or 105, he's willing to wait. He's not bound by time. And it says this, he's not slow keeping his promise. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the sign that has come through the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is come home to God. And Christmas, there's no better time to do it than then. The second exclamation is this, don't be afraid. Now, it's interesting if you look through the Christmas story, even starting with the birth of John the Baptist, who was an extended cousin of Jesus Christ. Their mothers were cousins. Zacharias, who served the Lord, he was struck dumb because of his unbelief. But from Zacharias to Mary, the mother of Jesus, to Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, to the shepherds abiding in the field, soon after showing up, this person said to them, don't be afraid. And that person, they thought, was an angel. Okay, they thought it was a person. It was a divine messenger from God. And the very first words are soon out of their mouth were, do not be afraid. So I figure this. If anyone walks up to you, whether it's in a store or church or at school, you know, at, at work, in the neighborhood, and out of their mouth, right after they start speaking to you, say, hey, don't be afraid. Pay attention, because that might be an angel from the Lord. But see, I'm here to say, don't be afraid. I'm saying this, stop fretting. Don't let fear drive your life. And so often we're driven by our unbelief rather than our belief. And fear can take over where faith should be. And just like we learned to breathe in and breathe out, I want to say spiritually breathe. Let go and let God have his way for Christmas. To the moms and the homemakers here, you know, the menu for Christmas Day and all the gifts that still have to be bought and wrapped and all the decorations, they're wonderful. But don't miss Christmas because of them. For dads and, you know, wage earners and, and everybody who's a wage earner, you know, don't get too concerned about the Christmas bonus. We know a movie about that one, don't we? Or too concerned about, you know, I got to get here to here to here to here. And, and we leave the Christ child behind. Just lay it down. God has your fear covered in Jesus Christ. And not in him alone, but in this church. See, I talk a lot about the vertical and the horizontal. I mean, there's vertical grace that comes down to us, lives within us, and then there's horizontal grace that we give to one another and receive from one another. And there's that vertical love and that horizontal love. It comes down from God to us and we love Him back, but it's, it becomes significant when we love other people. And I just want you to take a look around here today. This is your church family. These are the people whom you do life with. And don't be afraid. They've got your back. They'll be with you and for you. So let's not be such control freaks. We don't have to have everything going the way we want. We have to rest and relax in the ways of the Lord. Number three, a baby changes everything. Now, that's a uh, Faith Hill song. That's a billboard. 
And that's a card theme these days, but I want to tell you that's a truth for sure. I mean, in regular life, we would all testify a baby changes everything. Am I right? I mean, schedules and maybe where you live and how you decorate the house and where you go and what you spend your money on. And nobody ever had to teach a baby how to be selfish. Am I right about that? They want what they want when they want it. And even when they can't speak, all they do is cry. And then you've got to guess. Are they hungry? Are they dirty? Do they have a bellyache? You know, what is it that's going on here? But the baby becomes the center of attention, whether the baby intends to or not. It's just the way it is in true life. And I want to tell you, at Christmas, this baby changed everything about everything. This baby changed the course of history. If we went back there to Luke chapter 2, Simeon takes that six-week baby, uh, old baby in his arms, and he says, My eyes have seen your salvation, God. I know who this is. This is the promised Messiah. This is the deliverer for all people. He's a light to the Gentiles, and he's the glory of Israel. And then he, he holds that baby and he says to the mom and dad, this baby's really different. This baby's really special. Now, how would you like it if somebody, I'm going to say like me, an old man, held your baby in my arms and said, listen, your baby has a destiny. Your baby's going to cause a whole nation to fall and to rise. And there'll be a sign that he'll be spoken against. And the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You know what Simeon was talking about? The scene of the crucifixion. And if we go to the scene of the crucifixion, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Isn't that amazing? That a mom watched her son, you see, be die by capital punishment. She, she stood there and she watched but those strong disciples, all of them but John the apostle, had already run. All the strong men were gone. But his mom was there, and certainly a, a sword pierced her own soul. And I'd say, you know, how would you like it if somebody said that about your baby? But this baby changed the world. Fourthly, Jesus is the reason for the season. That's an old one, but a good one. See, sweet little baby Jesus became the suffering Savior. I figure he was in the wood, you know. He was laid in that cattle feeder. He was a carpenter's son, and he gave his life on two pieces of timber crossed, you know, as the cross upon which he died. Now, Anna said, listen, I know who this is. He is here because of redemption, to redeem. It means to buy back. And so Jesus came for that very reason. Now, you can never get past the deepest truth about Jesus coming to this earth. You've got to put this in your mind. He was born to die. Our salvation was not accomplished through his birth. Our salvation was not accomplished through his good works or his sinless life. Our salvation was accomplished through his death on Calvary's cross. And so you can't preach Christmas without preaching Easter, so to speak. And you've got to know, even on that cross when he cried out, it is finished. That's one word in the Greek language. It's teltelestai. It means perfected, completed. It means paid in full. Actually, if, if you know, I had an account at your store and I came and paid it off, if we were Greeks, your rubber stamp would say teltelestai, paid in full, paid off. He paid the sin debt for us. And that's the rest of the story. He was God's perfect man, man's perfect God, dying, rising from the grave, ascending uh, into heaven, and never forget, he's coming again. Galatians 4 says this, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights as sons. 
And it's really a good thing. We become the adopted sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 5 says, you see at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was born at just the right time, and he died at just the right time. And see, now today, today is a day of repentance, a time to turn around and come back to the Lord, a time to stop walking away from him and walking toward him. And Christmas makes that very clear. And lastly today, remember this, wise men still seek him. See, sometime later, up to two years later, if you pay attention to the text, There were wise men from the east who came bearing gifts, inquiring of Herod, where is this one who is born the king of the Jews? And if you look at that text in Matthew, you'll see they went to a house. They didn't go to a a place where there was a, a cattle feeder. They didn't go to outside an inn or out in a stable or on 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 the attachment to a house. They went to a house where they were living. And then Herod, when he was all rattled about this, what did he do? He put out a decree to kill all the baby boys. How old? Two years and younger. So this didn't, they, they didn't show up the night of the nativity. This is when he's, he's a toddler. And they came to worship him. And Herod said, wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. <laughs> I'm going to eliminate him. But the wise men They still sought him. They still found him. They still worshiped him. See, the world certainly does not give credence to Jesus Christ being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's okay with them if we sing it in church. It's okay with them if we keep it to ourselves. It's okay with them if we have our rights to say and believe what we want to say and believe. But but the world doesn't want you putting that on them in any way. Just like Herod said, listen, he's not welcome in my life. The world says the same. It's okay if he remains that pink little boy in a manger, but maybe he was really olive little boy, meaning he was Jewish, okay? Or even a suffering vicar on a cross. If you want to believe he died on the cross for you, that's okay, but he didn't do it for me is what the world would say. See, don't tell the world He's Lord of all. He's worthy of worship. And by him, all of the world will be called into account. And so we can't abandon Jesus in the manger. No matter what the world thinks and says, the message is wise men still do seek him. Listen to this little writing called the lightning rod factor. Either Jesus will be embraced as God or hated as the world's greatest nuisance. Either he will be the smell of life or the smell of death. Wholesale repentance or wholesale rejection. Those who love him will show that love by strict allegiance, acknowledging him as their Lord, giving him first place in their lives. And those that hate him will be repulsed by his name. They mock him and do the same to his followers. Jesus is a lightning rod. Either he's the rock of salvation or the stone of stumbling. For all people, either he is heaven or hell. There has never been more love for a person and at the same time, never more hatred for a person. It's not that we put Jesus on trial. He's already vindicated as God. But Jesus puts all people on trial as to how they will respond to him. It's ultimately what we do with Jesus as to whether we rise or fall. And I would just say, what are you going to do with Jesus? Remember, wise men still seek him. So I want to close up an inconvenient, unconventional Christmas. I think if I had time to sit with you and ask, tell me about your story. What's the, what's the most inconvenient, unconventional Christmas you've ever had? I thought I'd briefly tell you about two of mine. One was when I was a young man, fourth or fifth grade. My dad, had he was prone to depression. He was a World War II vet, seen a lot of killing. I imagine did some killing, never would talk about it. But the holidays were hard for him. He was manic depressive, bipolar today. And uh, I have those tendencies, just my highs aren't too high, my lows aren't too low. 
but I'm up and down. How about you? <laughs> Sometimes they're rough, but my dad was in a, in a psychiatric unit one Christmas and couldn't come home, and so we delayed Christmas and spent that day visiting him. It wasn't bad. It was good. It was just inconvenient, and it was unconventional, and when he did come home, we had a great Christmas, but here I am, 64, and that registered. I can remember being 35, thinking my mom and dad divorced. And my dad was already gone, and, and I still wished that my mom and dad could be together, and my sisters and I could all come to one house for Christmas. That never goes away, and you think, man, Christmas could get you up, or Christmas could get you down. And somewhere along about 23 years ago, I had some arthroscopic cleanup of a knee, ended up with a staph infection, spent 11 days over Christmas in the hospital with IVs. It didn't nearly lose my, my life, but if the antibiotics wouldn't work, I, I would have lost my life. I missed church that year. Didn't worry about the wax on the pews or anything like that. But that Christmas, on Christmas Eve, friends came to visit, brought the Lord's Supper, my daughter brought me a Reba McIntyre cassette tape, and I listened to Reba McIntyre sing Christmas songs. And my best presents, this is really funny, but my best presents that year were a haircut and an enema. <laughs> now, that's pretty unconventional, and it was inconvenient. But I got to tell you, the relief was really great. But I just want to say... That's when I remember. I don't remember all the ones when everything went right and we got all the, ki the gifts that the kids wanted and all those kinds of things. I remember my poor wife being there that day could hardly keep her eyes open because our kids were smaller and she was trying to run a business, be a preacher's wife, do all these things, and she made time to come and visit me. But see, I just want to say it's okay. It's okay no matter what's going on in your life. If you're separated from family and friends, if you just had a breakup, if you're in about your job, if you have money trouble, don't miss Christmas. Don't let all that stuff rob you of what it can be. And so keep the truth of Christmas in your heart. If we went backwards in that Luke 2 passage, it says this, the shepherds came and it says they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. And then this verse says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. His mom said, what, what is this? Oh, God wants to use me. Okay. I hear you. And she treasured all that in her heart. And if we go past the passage we read today, down into Luke chapter 2 toward the end, it takes Jesus to being 12 years old. So we go from his birth to being circumcised at eight days to being presented at the temple at 40 days. And now he's 12 years old. And they go to the temple. And you remember the story. He was teaching the teachers and they traveled in caravans, and they started home, and people said, where's, where's Yeshua? Where's Yeshua? And they go back to the temple, and they find him. And he says, you know, he has to be about his father's business. And he says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And verse 50 says, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And verse 51 says, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Any kids that you know, listen, even Jesus listened to his mom, okay? But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. And I would say as Christmas worshipers, let's be like Mary. No matter what's going on in our life, no matter what the world says, let's worship Jesus in our hearts. Let's bow our heads. Almighty Father, we thank you for these moments to be together. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that we can laugh a little and, Father, that we can have memories. But, Lord, we thank you for the great inspiration that makes transformation in our lives through the power of your word. Above all, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.